Hey, this is Jeff, and today I'm going to definitively and objectively answer the question, which is the better game, Fallout 3 or Fallout New Vegas? Now, this might seem like troll bait, but I welcome it when people challenge my opinions, because it gives me the chance to strengthen any weak points in my reasoning, sometimes even changes my mind. But you can't argue with facts. So I'm going to rate both games in a number of important categories and give them an indisputable quantitative score. Let's get started. The first category is graphics. So looking at the graphics objectively, they use the same Gamebryo graphics engine, their textures are the same resolution, their models have about the same number of polygons, there's no significant difference. That's just a measurable, inarguable fact. So in terms of the technical specifications, it's a tie. You might say, but how can that be? Fallout 3 is so uniformly brown and gray, and New Vegas has much more variety and color. Yes, but that's a visual design choice, not a limitation of the graphics engine. Consciously or subconsciously, I think that's part of the game's commentary on nuclear war. Among areas that were largely untouched, even a desert has more vitality than a once-lush mid-Atlantic temperate zone that was hit hard by nuclear weapons. Nonetheless, even though Fallout 3 does a great job of presenting that atmosphere of unrelenting desolation, I'd have to give the edge to New Vegas simply because it does have that variety. The lighting schemes can be a bit heavy-handed at times, like Camp Forlorn Hope and Cottonwood Cove, but the contrast between different areas keeps you from getting desensitized. On the other hand, you might say, if they're technically equal, why is the performance better in Fallout 3? Well, that's just because New Vegas is a busier game in general, especially in areas like the Strip, where there are way more objects with animation and physics, or just generally in the desert, where the line of sight is forever. So when you're walking around and a new exterior cell loads, you get some lag. But knowing why it happens doesn't change the fact that it happens. On the same PC, with exactly the same graphics settings for both games, I get a measurably lower frame rate in New Vegas than I do in Fallout 3, so Fallout 3 wins on performance. Okay, let's talk about companions next. Companions are a big part of both games. Well, if you want them to be, you can complete either game without ever picking up a single follower. In fact, it's kind of weird that there are so many companion options in Fallout 3 at all, considering your character's canonical name is the Lone Wanderer. <laughs> but I digress. Let's start with companion system mechanics. I think everyone intuitively understands there's more depth in New Vegas, but let's talk facts. In Fallout 3, you need to meet different requirements to hire different companions, but then they basically stay with you forever unless you fire them. Some of them do do a periodic karma check and leave if you do things they don't like, but they don't really change in their attitudes or abilities. In New Vegas, you also have the different hiring requirements, but they have a loyalty system with numerous triggers and side quests, and getting them to be more loyal has measurable consequences in terms of perks they give you. Plus, there's the companion wheel, which gives you quicker and more flexible options to set their tactics and other behaviors. So, regarding the companion system mechanics, New Vegas wins. Now, game mechanics aside, what about the companions themselves? We already talked about how New Vegas has more conditions and quests and dialogue for the loyalty system, so we can't hold it against the companions in Fallout 3 that they don't have as much to say. So, I'm only going to consider the relevance and depth of each character. Uh, taken as a whole, this would be a daunting task, so I will use a head-to-head -head format. First up, the Super Mutants. It's almost impossible to complete the main quest in Fallout 3 without at least meeting Fox. Uh, he's one of only two rational, non-hostile Super Mutants in that game, and he can give you valuable backstory about Vault 87. Uh, retrieving the Gek is extremely challenging without his help, and if you have Broken Steel installed, he's one of the characters who can let you keep playing after the main quest is complete without being a suicidal idiot or being a dick to Sarah. Lily from New Vegas is sad, admittedly, but Fox wins. The Ghouls, on the other hand, Raul from New Vegas is probably my favorite companion out of all of them in either game. He can play an important part in a couple of significant quests related to Black Mountain, and his soul-searching and contemplation of his possible mortality is a parallel, well, at least complementary to the Courier's own near-death experience and search for identity. 
Caron from Fallout 3 is badass, but he's in a location you might never find, uh, completely irrelevant to the main storyline, and doesn't even have the karma checks some other characters have. You buy his contract, he's got your back, that's it. Uh, Raul wins. Now the dogs. Okay, Rex in New Vegas has ten gentle relationships with a couple of principal characters, but the whole thing with him finding a new brain, that's not how brains work, people. It's not Rex anymore after the transplant. Uh, more to the point, they're puppies. How can you choose? Tie. And the robots? This one obviously goes to Ed E. I tend to be an AI skeptic, by which I mean being programmed to mimic human behavior doesn't necessarily make a machine sentient, but within the context of New Vegas, it's pretty obvious that Eddie is, or at least shows signs of emergent sentience. Plus, he's a principal character in Lonesome Road, which makes him integral to the Courier's own backstory. Sergeant RL3 from Fallout 3 is definitely non-sentient, and I think you can only hire him as the result of a random encounter, so definitely not relevant to the plot. And some tough women. Veronica's an interesting character, but you can do all of the Brotherhood of Steel stuff related to the main quest in New Vegas without even meeting her. The same is true of Cross. You can complete the main quest in Fallout 3 without ever meeting her, but she's integral to the Lone Wanderer's backstory because she escorted James to Vault 101 after he left Rivet City. Uh, plus, she's a cyborg, but uh, even not counting the cool factor, Cross wins on relevance. Messed up women. I personally think the brainwashed slave thing with Clover in Fallout 3 is more interesting than the depressed alcoholic Cass in New Vegas, but in terms of relevance, Cass can be an unwitting victim in two side quests that can be helpful in completing the main quest, but aren't required. Clover, unless you can pass a very hard speech check to get into Little Lamplight, you will meet Clover during the main quest, for better or worse. So, slight edge to Clover. Next up, depressed combat vets. Jericho from Fallout 3 and Boone from New Vegas are basically the same character. They've participated in atrocities, they question their own self-worth, and they're all too eager to resume killing people if you hire them. Uh, you'll probably run into both of them, since they hang out in places that are important to the main plot of their respective games, but neither one is key to that plot. Boone can clue you into the fact that the NCR isn't as squeaky clean as they let on, and Jericho implies the same about Megaton, so tie. Which leaves Butch from Fallout 3 and Arcade from New Vegas. I like Arcade's intelligent, kind of snarky personality. Uh, the followers of the Apocalypse are probably the faction I personally identify with the most in that game, and his backstory with the Enclave is very interesting. But Butch is the Lone Wanderer's childhood nemesis in Fallout 3, directly involved in at least three significant main story events before you escape from Vault 101, so it's gotta be Butch. Moving on to the next category, DLC. Comparing the DLC that came out for these two games is a monumental task, so I'm going to do this in the head-to-head -head format again. First up, The Pit for Fallout 3 versus Honest Hearts for New Vegas. In both cases, you're hundreds of miles from home, extremely different visual design from their respective base games. Uh, in both, you're ultimately faced with a choice to support one of two factions, and those choices aren't quite as clear-cut as they seem at first if you look a bit deeper than surface appearances. They're both full of interesting characters that I can't even begin to list, but uh, there are even strong parallels between the guys at the top. Ruthless, determined, SOB, left for dead, survives, becomes the leader of the people they once fought, right? Um, Asher's a bit more larger than life, but it's kind of cool that after all the supernatural stuff you hear about the burned man, the truth behind the legend is that Joshua Graham is just a pissed off dude. Overall, I like the pit more, but I can't discount the possibility that could be because I used to live in Pittsburgh. So in the interest of objectivity, I'll call that one a tie. Next, Point Lookout, Fallout 3, versus Dead Money, New Vegas. We'll compare these two because greed and or curiosity lead you into trouble with dangerous relics of the pre-war past. They're both very cool for the first 10 minutes. <laughs> they, uh, they both look very different from their base games. They have challenging new enemies, new environmental hazards. They have stories with a lot of potential. 
And then an hour later, you're just praying for it to be over. <laughs> Um, if you were scoring this on cool factor, it's hard not to go with Point Lookout for letting you blow up a nuclear submarine. Uh, plus, it has a bunch of Cthulhu references. Speaking of which, um, taking the Krivbekna back to the capital wasteland to destroy it might be a more important world-saving project for the Lone Wanderer than turning on Project Purity. And the fact that you have to go to the Dunwich building to do it means that Point Lookout wins on the pain-in-the-ass factor, too. Um... As far as tie-in with the main game, Dead Money really doesn't. Uh, it ties in with the other DLC for New Vegas, uh, as far as Ulysses' backstory with Elijah. But all the stuff about Veronica's relationship with Christine, or Veronica's relationship with Elijah, uh, is barely mentioned. So gotta go with Point Lookout. Mothership Zeta, Fallout 3 versus Old World Blues, New Vegas. Uh, these two are obviously comparable because they deal with classic, over-the-top 1950s sci-fi tropes. Mothership Zeta takes a lot of flack for reasons I don't completely agree with. I like it a lot, but uh, that debate's kind of irrelevant. Mothership Zeta sucks, Mothership Zeta is okay, doesn't matter because Old World Blues is one of the greatest DLCs for any game ever. It wins. And Operation Anchorage, Fallout 3 versus Lonesome Road, New Vegas. On the surface, this seems like the least similar matchup, but they're both fairly linear in design, and they're both focused on the past, Anchorage, obviously, with events leading up to the Great War, and Lonesome Road with the Courier's own past. They both have sections where verticality plays a bigger part than it generally does in the base games, and they both prominently feature new enemies who ambush you, Chinese commandos in stealth suits and tunnelers, respectively. Most importantly, they both have a mysterious antagonist who pulls your strings. Now, General Chase might not seem that mysterious, but if you pick up on the other lore related to him scattered around the base game and the DLC, his stories don't add up. He was BSing somebody in the DoD about his projects big time. But this comparison could have been as short as Ulysses, Lonesome Road wins, <laughs> in terms of either cool factor or relevance to the courier's own backstory. And finally, there's Broken Steel for Fallout 3, which has no equivalent in New Vegas. Now, I understand from a storytelling perspective why some games have a definite endgame beyond which you can't continue, particularly in narrative games that are more linear, but in an open-world RPG, it seems pushy. Uh, the first time I ever played Fallout 3, I was literally screaming at the screen, My destiny, my ass, Fox! You are immune to radiation! So... Imagine my delight when Broken Steel came out. The interesting thing is, uh, there are unused voice files in New Vegas for dialogue that's clearly in the context of one or the other of the factions having won the Second Battle of Hoover Dam. So they were thinking about letting the player continue after that point. Whether that was a feature in the base game that got cut or a DLC that got cancelled, I have no idea. But Broken Steel obviously takes this one for Fallout 3. And for the final category... A lot of people have said the factions are more nuanced in New Vegas than Fallout 3. No, they aren't. You're thinking of Skyrim. The conflict between the Imperials and the Stormcloaks in Skyrim is nuanced. The factions in New Vegas are every bit as stereotypically black and white heroes and villains as Fallout 3. Maybe more so if you subscribe to the view that the Enclave are actually the good guys in Fallout 3. The argument goes that they're the legitimate government, they just want to put more resources into getting the purifier up and running faster, and provide stability and security for the people of the wasteland. The only reason the Lone Wanderer takes them down is a personal vendetta for the death of James, who was basically a suicide bomber. Um, to be clear, I don't subscribe to that view, but it's out there. Uh, in New Vegas... Kaisar's rambling justification for his atrocities is the same as any other psychotic dictator. Trying to rationalize it by saying the roads are safer in Legion territory because there aren't any raiders is like saying Mussolini was a good leader because the trains ran on time. On the other hand, everything Mr. House does is for the recovery and advancement of humanity. Yes, he's arrogant, and it would be easier to like him if he was a grandfatherly Morgan Freeman type, but he stands nothing to gain personally from his policies. And yes, if your only previous experience with the Brotherhood of Steel was in Fallout 3, you might think he's a bit harsh with them. But take my word for it, the West Coast Brotherhood is a fascist menace that needs to be destroyed. And that's not hyperbole, I mean fascist in the dictionary definition of the term. 
Finally, the NCR is a democracy. They do some good things and some bad things. The morality of a democracy is by definition equal to the median morality of its voters. If the majority says, let's be imperialist conquerors, displace indigenous people, and slaughter them if they get uppity about it, well, that's what they do. Like the NCR and more than one real-world democracy. There's also the Yes Man ending, which is really more of a fail-safe, so you can finish the game, even if you alienate all three of the other main factions. But in terms of morality, the only difference from the NCR option is that the degree of ultimate harm or benefit to the Mojave will be based on the whim of the courier rather than the whim of the mob. So the Legion is unequivocally evil, Mr. House is unequivocally good, and the NCR is a classic RPG example of moral neutrality. I know a lot of people have that backwards and think the NCR is good and House is the neutral option, but they're wrong. And anyone who considers the mere inclusion of a neutral option nuanced is wrong. <laughs> Bottom line, in terms of factions with ambiguous morality, neither game has that, so that's a tie. So let's go through the categories and tally the scores. Starting with graphics, the graphics engine is a tie, New Vegas has the edge in visual design, and Fallout 3 has the edge in performance, so that's a tie in the graphics category overall. Comparing companions, the depth of the companion system mechanics is way better in New Vegas, but the head-to-head -head comparison of the companions themselves, Fox over Lily, Raul over Caron, Dogmeat and Rex tie, Eddie over RL3, Crossover Veronica, Clover over Cass, Jerrica and Boone tie, Butch over Arcade, Edge to the relevance of the Fallout 3 companions, so that's a tie in the companions category overall. Comparing the DLC, The Pit versus Honest Hearts, tie. Point Lookout beats Dead Money, one point for Fallout 3. Old World Blues beats Mothership Zeta, one point for New Vegas. Lonesome Road beats Operation Anchorage, another point for New Vegas. Broken Steel versus Game Over after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, one point for Fallout 3, which is a tie for the DLC category. And finally, Factions and Morality was a tie, so the final, objective, inarguable conclusion is... Tie! These are both classic examples of the open-world RPG genre, and two of the greatest games ever made. If you disagree, you're wrong, because I proved it with facts and math and science. So, happy April Fool's Day, and I'll see you next time.